I'm David DeCook. I was a reporter for the Shimokan News Item in Shimokan, Pennsylvania. And between you know, 1976 and 1986, I covered the Centralia Mine Fire quite intensively. I wrote approximately 500 articles uh, in that 10-year period. I kind of actually dreaded this assignment because uh, Centralia Borough Council had this reputation of having meetings that lasted three hours or more. Toward the end of the meeting, this kind of tired looking middle-aged guy uh, stands up and he starts talking about this fire burning under the ground near his house and how he thinks that if nothing is done about it that it was going to go like move underneath the entire town. A lot of people thought the mine fire had been taken care of by this project that the Bureau of Mines, the U.S. Bureau of Mines did in the late 1960s to build up a, a fly ash barrier to block the fire from Centralia. They, they believed that the barrier was failing and the fire was starting to move into Centralia again. Francis Gonzalez was actually, he was the president of Centralia Borough Council at, at that meeting in 1976 uh, that I went to. And he, he said that they would go out, they would, uh, they would set the dumps on fire, usually just before Memorial Day, and then they would uh, you know, wash, the, wash them down with water from a tanker truck. And, and he said that was what was, was, had happened you know, in 1962. Now, he didn't say, we set the fire, but he, he laid out the scenario of what happened, that this is what had happened, you know, that they had sent the guys from the fire department out there to set the dump on fire, thought it was out, but it wasn't. It spread through a hole in the, in the dump pit, you know, into the network of abandoned mines. It wasn't spontaneous combustion like they'd said for years. They set the fire. It was a horrible accident. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Robert Hughes. I'm the executive director for the Eastern Pennsylvania Coalition for Abandoned Mine Reclamation. And we're standing at the site of a former church here in Centralia, where 22 years ago, I was down here as an intern working for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that had the job and tasks of coming down here several times to monitor the gas readings and the methane and the carbon monoxide levels that were at this particular site. I remember coming through the doorways of this church and as soon as you got into the church, obviously there was dead silence, but it was kind of a steamy, uh, you know, spooky little feeling that you had to, to come into the, to the church and then head down to the basement. You kind of didn't have long to get down there and get the readings and get out. We were told not to stay in too long, obviously, for, because of the gases. My name's Tom Hill. I used to live in town here in Centralia from 1959 to 1989. My connection with the town is it's basically where I grew up. From, I was eight years old when I moved here, when uh, my mother passed away and my grandparents took me in. So this is where I grew up. This is what I knew. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody was friendly. It's not like things are now. You know, it was just a quiet, great place with great people. And I think of the people that did live, live here, you know, they had lives, you know, they had things to do. They raised their kids here, you know, and, and now there's nothing, you know, just nothing. Yep. Nature's taken over. This right here is the extreme end of West Center Street. This is where I lived for 30 years. It's hard to believe. The only thing left is a cinder block from the chimney underneath that yellow safety zone sign. That's all that's left. This was the last house on 61, leaving Centralia, going to Mount Carmel. Wow. Doesn't look like that little house anymore. I didn't stay here to see them tear the house down. I didn't want to see that. After that was done, it was probably a couple of years before I came back in the, into town. I didn't want to see it. And then the first time I did come back, it wasn't like this. The weeds were about that high. But uh, wow, you would never ever think that people lived there. Yeah. In the 90s, there was still a lot of buildings in town. At that time, you know, I could look around here and, and homes that uh, you, you could see coming through here. And now coming back some 20 years later, it's, uh, 
It's a very different place. It's very desolate. I think a whole lot more could have been done here. There could have been some type of restoration work and, and reclamation work, not just bulldozing places over and, you know, forgetting about them. So Cherry, a community revitalization project, something, you know, and, and do something small. Because I think that would probably benefit this community and make something more positive out of it than just having it as, you know, the town that was on fire. My name is Harold Mervine. I'm a resident of Centralia. I lived in Centralia probably the first about 30 years of my life. I've been back about 10 years now. I wanted to see the town survive, so that's one of the reasons I came back. Today we're out here for a uh, beautification project after seven years of, of cleanups down here in Centralia with a bunch of partners in, in the borough. And after that time, after seven years, we've really gotten to the point where there's not as much trash to pick up and we wanted to move towards a beautification type effort and uh, decided on a planting project where we got funded to do uh, a tree giveaway of apple trees to coal field communities and residents that live throughout the region. We had a focus on the Wyoming Valley and then we thought we could bring the other, one, other trees down here to Centralia and plant a bunch of wild trees of different species of apples around various plots that were state-owned parcels. That's Perfect. That's great. That's perfect. We don't even have to just leave it like that because we can push the dirt yeah, in. Yeah, that looks great. Thank you. I'm Laura Reinheimer, environmental educator at Epcamer, and I've worked there for three years. Epcamer actually gave me the chance to pursue my passion for the environment and also combine that with my love of education as well. 150 trees will be planted in Centralia. The services that this will bring to the ecosystem here are plenty. They'll attract pollinator species. They'll help regulate temperature. We're expecting 100 volunteers. We did a hard cutoff at that number due to COVID and other limited supplies. Um, however, we have about 100 people on the waiting list right now, so the turnout has been amazing. That's probably where the, the far sticks for the Methodist Church was probably right in there. Yeah, it's, it's like subsided right there, or just settled, you know? Yeah. When my dad was, was able, he used to borrow the neighbor's riding mower, and he kept, he'd spend three, four days a week. He had this, all this area cleared. He had several blocks. He had the school field all cleared. There were no trees up there then. I said he spent uh, all that time <clears throat> trying to keep the this place looking nice, you know. The effort was to give out these grow boxes that we're going to be planting the tree saplings in uh, down here in areas that we've already cleaned up and to keep them clean. Maybe by putting these trees down, we'll be a deterrent in addition to cameras that we've had placed down here over the years uh, to really start limiting the amount of trash that's going through Centralia, especially after all the, the volunteer help and uh, hundreds of people that have helped us clean up the town, you know, over the last, over the last eight years. What I see behind me is the kind of refuge that people have been throwing in Centralia since the large parts of it are uninhabited and the state really doesn't bother to take care of it. I walk around here almost every day and I will never see people doing this. They'll just come up here and dump it because they're too cheap to pay somebody to haul it away for them. It's just not right. You wouldn't like it if I came to their house and, you know, took like six months worth of my household garbage and spare tires and everything else and threw it on their front yard. But they think nothing of doing it here because they think, uh, you know, it's just, it's an empty lot, who cares? I think uh, it was over 53 tons of trash that we've pulled out of here in the last seven years, as well as all the spray cans that we found on Graffiti Highway in the last few years, in which we've taken out over 15,000 spray cans just along the guardrail and in the ditch down there. The dumps 
to be cleaned up and to get to the point of the beautification that we're trying to do here today and some ecological restoration in parts of the borough uh, that could just lose a little more diversity in some of the open space uh, vacant lots here where there are less trees and lots of sun that uh, plants like apple trees can, can grow for uh, as a part of this one project. Every year we have less and less trash to pick up, which is a great sign. However, if you could see in the background, there's still some trash out here. Um, even today, we've been picking up stuff all day. It's a never ending battle here. I've been, uh, I cleared this block and, and the block back here. I'm gradually trying to reclaim as much as I can of the area, keep it nice. Most of these homes have been backfilled decades ago. So this, the soil is settled as much as it could, and I think that's what we're seeing a lot of. Some of the areas, it's not subsidence as much as it is the soil settling and the backfill, and if they filled it with rock and debris uh, or brick, you know, and c cement block, that's what we're finding a lot of, and, and uh, that's just naturally gonna settle over time. They had uh, 250 trees donated. Uh, we didn't dig near the, that many holes. I would say they're probably going to get uh, probably close to 100 trees maybe planted. All in all, we only had to eliminate a few holes because of just maybe a lot of rock or a lot of rock in the fill. But for the most part, it seems to be going pretty smoothly. In this area right here, there was a Methodist church. And probably where you're standing, it was probably the neighborhood of where the, the, the parsonage stood. That church was in existence quite a while, at least 125 years. It's a sound that's becoming all too familiar. Construction crews ripping buildings into pieces. Workers have added four more buildings to the pile of plywood here. For them, it means long hours and lots of hard work. A good example is Jim McFadden. He spends his day boarding up homes set for demolition. For him, the job hits a little too close to home. Losing friends, people that I've known for 20, 25 years and uh, have to move, probably have to move myself. Sad. Think you have to board up your own house? Probably. This building used to be a church and a teen club. Now it's just amongst the piles of rubble here in Centralia. And for this bulldozer and for the workers here, now it's on to the next building, just waiting for the inevitable. So this picture shows a lot of Centralia. I was standing on the, the highway on the mountain going up to Aristus, but it just shows you that this was a real town. I mean, there, there was a lot to it, you know, uh, not a huge town, but you know, you can see that it's uh, not just a, a crossroads, you know, it was just, um, it spread out over this valley and there were at that time probably just about a thousand people living in Centralia. But this is the Odd Fellows Cemetery right here. That's the that was the Protestant cemetery in Centralia. And this was the one that was closest to uh, the dump they set on fire. And the reason they set the dump on fire was because people were, would be coming out to this cemetery on Memorial Day, and they wanted it to be a more pleasant experience, not have smelly garbage. I was a reporter at WNEP-TV Channel 16 in Scranton uh, from 1983 to 1989. And especially the first couple of years uh, that I was there, I extensively covered the situation in Centralia, the, uh, pro the proposals that were made here, the uh, relocation, the buyout. In today's mail is the offer Joe Moran and wife Ava are getting for their house and store. Grandchildren look on as Ava opens the envelope to find the offer is $40,000. She had hoped for forty-five dollars to $50,000. i am really not satisfied, but after all, the way the government works, yeah, after 22 years now, I know that we have to go. In fact, these lifelong residents of Centralia will also get moving expense money as part of the federal buyout. Being like born all over again. And I'm here uh, 68 years. So I think you can always get uh, used to someplace else. It won't be easy. Because of the mine fire below, the Morans hope to leave Centralia soon. There's no turning back now for Joe and Ava Moran. They've already started to close down the little candy store they've operated here for 16 years. Bob Costantini, Newswatch 16, Centralia.
there was a huge controversy over the values they would put on the houses because the, the Interior Department in Washington wanted to apply what became derisively known as mine fire value. The Interior Department insisted on, on lowballing them and, and they knew it. They knew it right from the start, the people did. You know, like, um, the O'Hearn family, uh, Fritz O'Hearn, complained bitterly about this. And, and when the big relocation came, the one that was funded with the $42 million and by Congress in 1983, it was specifically written into the law that mine fire value could not be applied you know, to the homes. The night in August of 1983, when the town held the vote uh, about whether they wanted to move, I still remember my opening line in my live shot that night. It was 11 o'clock news, the votes had been tallied, and the anchors tossed it to me, and I was standing right here, basically. And I remember just saying simply, by a margin of two to one, the people of Centralia are saying, let's move. Because the options that they were presented with, as I recall, were stark in a lot of ways. There was talk because of the mine fire. One of the proposals was to dig a giant trench in the middle of town here. It would have gone as much as 400 feet deep as sort of a break for the fire, eventually. And it was going to be massively wide, and a bunch of homes were going to have to be taken anyway. How could you live in a town where there's a trench on each side of you? Fran McKeefrey is looking for the federal government to move the town rather than dig trenches. She joins about 200 people at the Centralia Borough Hall to hear about plans to either dig the entire mine fire out or dig trenches around it. She learns if the federal government goes ahead with the digging, it will assume liability for problems caused. But life in Centralia would be hard. Trenching work would last for four years and go 24 hours. Around the clock, so we're talking, uh, you know, uh, bulldozers and earth movers running at 3 o'clock in the morning. To take out all the coal was going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. The other option then became, the, the, the one that the, the people voted for, was to relocate the town. It was a very emotional time for the folks here in this town as they tried to figure out what to do. This is part of a larger uh, ecological project that we actually gave out apple trees in the mine impacted regions in our community um, because historically people grew their own plants in um, mine impacted communities uh, to kind of get financial freedom from the coal family or the coal barons. So they actually didn't have to buy their food from the company store. They can make their own food then. Um, so we wanted to give back to the community in a, a food bearing uh, tree so that we can do carbon sequestration and food at the same time. Um, historically, up in Centralia, there were apple trees planted here. Um, there's actually a street over there called Apple Alley. Uh, there's still some apple trees naturally um, up here that we did not plant. So we figured it's a good spot. Um, the soil test came back that they would do well here. So that was the species of tree we uh, decided to go with. Here we're giving out the pollinator seeds because it makes sense in this spot uh, to attract the butterflies and the bees and be good overall for the environment. Each sapling right now is about four to five feet tall. 
Um, but they're going to be, they're dwarf apple trees, so they're going to get anywhere from 11 to 13 feet uh, high. We were one of the first uh, groups of families that were relocated because we lived up close to um, where most of the mine fire was. So at the top of town, right next to Coddington's gas station. So he and, and a couple families around us were the first families that were relocated back in 1982. What you're looking at right now is South Street and South Locust Avenue. My house is across the street. It was right here at the corner, 202 Locust Avenue. Now it's replaced with overgrown weeds and full grown trees where my house used to stand. It makes me sad because like I was saying earlier, you know, when I bring my own children here and show them the town that I grew up in, I can't, it doesn't have the same impact as if I can say, well, there's my house and there's the yard I used to play in because now it's just all, you know, a vacant lot overgrown with trees. This is South Locust Avenue where we lived in the holes that were drilled in the ground as well as the cracks that I remember seeing smoke coming out of. This was a house, two houses down from us. So right next to this house is another house. We called it back then half double. And then ours was the one um, next, right next door to that. This was the um, carbon monoxide detector that was placed in our house and they kept monitoring the gases in it. And as you can see, there's alarm on the side of it. And when the gases would get too toxic, the levels would get too high, then that alarm would sound. And it was not pleasant at all, it was very loud. This is one of the very few pictures we have of my house. You see my dad and my mom in the background, and there's our um, neighbors, the Andrade is in the front. My older brother Jimmy is leaning against the uh, street post. We have Mr. Wondolowski, the mayor. I don't know who this is in particular, but it was a government official at the time that came to do walkthroughs of our houses. I've been coming back for the cleanups for years now. So I first met Bobby a few years back. So he introduced, you know, he came and organized all that. And so when I found out it was tree planting, I said, oh, this is awesome. Something besides picking up trash for a change. <laughs> so yeah, I was very excited. Epcamer's goal isn't really to change anything down here or turn it into anything else other than uh, some restoration and cleanup. And so we think that the trees here in lots that right now they weren't going to be built on uh, anytime soon. They haven't been built on for decades now. That uh, to add some trees would add to the restoration, add to the greening of Centralia, and prevent further litter and trash disposal that we've picked up from all these sites already. For us, it's more about bringing the community together, bringing former residents together, bringing more people to Epcamer to serve in the capacity that we asked them to do, to do these cleanups and do the restoration and the remediation of these old coal towns and these mining impacted areas that we have throughout Northeastern and North Central Pennsylvania. I live not too far away. I heard about the event. I thought it was a great opportunity to help the community do something good for the environment. I saw uh, the event info to sign up and I signed up right away. Remember the town what it was. I come up here uh, with the up camera uh, to do the garbage cleanup yearly. And uh, basically just come up to uh, plant a tree for memory of my family uh, that are buried up here in St. Ignatius. My friend Laura organized this event and I wanted to support her and it was a very, very good thing to do and I'm encouraging my son to work on environmental causes as well. So it was important not just for me to support my friend but to teach my son about this as well. I dedicated the tree to my godfather and Uncle Michael. I feel like it's going excellent today. I'm so happy with how smooth everything's running, um, how great the volunteers are working and we got done in record time. <laughs> it's nice to see that they're trying to get the environment back to like its natural beauty almost. So I came just to, you know, to help out and the environment's really important to me. It's amazing. It's overwhelming. <laughs> it's great to see the turnout and the people who are just here for the right reasons and want to see this get done. My mom actually put together a painting um, that had different tree branches and everybody could add their fingerprint to the painting to represent an apple and um, in green they wrote their name on it um, just to leave a legacy to behind and to show that we're all coming together to make this project and that we need everybody together. I've seen such a such a positive energy from the people at the cleanups and I think it's great to see every year 
you could see the impact from the year before. There's less and less trash, and now we're moving on to this beautification project and actually going from dumpsters to trees planted in there. Um, and just the camaraderie of everyone. It's like a big family reunion every year when they come back um, and seeing former residents and even people who still live here uh, get to be a part of it is really cool. This Appalachian tree tr plant and project was chosen by Groasis and our funders, uh, the Mental Insight Foundation and ISI Inc. out of California to be uh, a real regional location here. The other places that these type of plantings are being done are in Ethiopia and Colombia and South America. And we were the third location to be chosen here in Northeastern PA to do this. So we feel very privileged to be a part of this international effort to kind of highlight this particular technology called the grow box um, that is biodegradable and will allow these trees to grow relatively easily with mother nature supplying the water. And we do the initial planting and hopefully things take off here in the next few years and we'll see some budding apple trees to coincide with some of the apple trees we've already seen that are growing around here. The Centralia mine fire story is unique. It threatened an entire community. I mean, there have been there have been other mine fires in the past, but with Centralia, it seemed like an all or nothing you know, situation that the entire town was threatened with being wiped off the map. And another important factor in understanding the story is that this came along in the mid-1970s at the advent, the birth of concern about the environment. And there were a lot of reporters out there, me included, who were looking for that big environmental story. And I think that was a, a, a key factor that propelled this story beyond the region, beyond Pennsylvania, was because there was all this new interest in the bad things that were happening to our environment. And here's a living proof of it. It's just an amazing story of, of man versus nature, you know, man versus man, and, and it never loses its interest.